Hello there, my name is Cog, and I play D&D. I've been playing RPGs for most of my life, and I've recently decided it was time to share some of my stories with the world. There's just so many of them. I've been inspired by other D&D YouTubers, but mostly this is just for me and my friends, and if others can find some enjoyment out of it, all the better. To begin with, I'd like to start with a group I GM for in our homebrew world, which we call Numeranthia. This is a high fantasy world that a bunch of GMs and players work together to build, and as such, it takes a vast amount of inspiration and elements from a broad collection of our favourite fandoms, not just limited to fantasy. This group, which we ended up calling The Breakfast Club, was meant to be a simple one-shot dungeon crawl, in and out. But when the Rona happened, we decided to make it a regular occurrence, and then ended up playing almost every week since. The story begins in a region of our world called Durifen, or more commonly, the Durin's Mountains. It's a region thick with vertical surfaces, bordered by wild highlanders to its west, pompous elves to its north, and thick, mysterious jungles to its south. This was a wealthy region, bordered over by a dwarven king. Under the shadow of a mountain called Sky Ulfur sits a village called Driscoll, a trading hub, and home to a vast variety of different people from many different cultural backgrounds. This was once a small town, which grew large and powerful off the Great Unlug Rail, a unique form of transport very new to the world. The Unlug was a clockwork train that combined gnomish design with dwarvish creativity. Its purpose was to take resources and wealthy passages from Driscoll to Goldstone and every stop in between. Our particular adventure begins on a dewy winter's morning. Three adventurers chance to board the caboose of this train together. First there was Hastor, a dragonborn with striking leathery wings. Hastor wore red robes with a golden trim marked by mysterious sigils. He kept his hood low over his reptilian snout and at all times trailing behind him there was the low droning sound of bees that called home a hive fastened to his back. Something about his presence would lead you to believe that he was not entirely sound of mind. He made his way into the carriage and found himself a cabin in the back. The next to board was Moran Genkis. This slightly armoured wood elf wore tribal tattoos upon his face and walked with a poise of grace and arrogance. Shoulder over his shoulder was a simple cloak with a strap tightened over it, bearing the weight of a quiver packed with arrows and a short bow, unstrung and slid inside. He opted to sit at a table by the fire and light his pipe while he waited for the journey to begin. Finally, there was Iliana Battleby, a blue-skinned Ganassi with hair that floated like a fluffy cloud and druidic markings on her forehead. She bore no armour and carried any weapons that she did own in an adventurous pack slung over her shoulder. As she boarded nervously, she balanced a small collection of books in her arms, and she was easily startled by Moran. Quickly, she made her way to one of the cabins, making a clear effort to not even acknowledge Moran's presence, and closing the door firmly behind her. The train started with a rumble and a clank, and it was soon on its way. These three strangers, it seemed, had no intention of ever interacting. Moran kept by the fire, while Iliana and Hastel remained confined to their cabins. Though Iliana did not much like people, or at least people who weren't Ganassi, she spent her entire life devoted to the career of collecting stories and selling them. Currently, she was low on ideas. Some nobody called the Crimson Fish, whom lived in the most unpleasant part of the world, had tried to hire her to write his autobiography, claiming to be a famous adventurer. But he had never shown up at their meeting place, and so she was on a long and disappointing journey back to her home. Moran was on the run. For some time, he'd operated a shady business in the village of Helgit, along with his partner Curzon. They could handle all kinds of troubles for the right price, and they were very good at it. But one day, Moran and Curzon were offered a job that Moran didn't trust. The money was just too good, and the risks far too high. They opted to decline. At least, that's what he thought. Going behind Moran's back, Curzon did the job anyways, and to make matters worse, he'd set Moran up to take the fall. Moran was to be executed, and would have been too, had half the town not gone up in smoke and flames the night before.
Quickly, the assassin elf took to the old trade road and made his way to Driscoll. He used what little coin he had left to buy himself onto the Onlag, with no real plan in mind, only a desire to put some distance between him and Helgit while he rebuilt his fortune. Ironically, Hastor too was on the run, and by no small coincidence, he'd made his way from the very same place as Moran, arriving in Driscoll not even a day later. Under the name Crotu, he'd been staying at an inn called the Pigeon's Fancy while he worked on a mysterious project. Being low on funds, he made the mistake of taking out a loan from a very dangerous group of people. People who came back at him requesting an unreasonably high sum of interest. Hastor, being short-tempered, opted to negotiate aggressively. And a brawl broke out. He attacked his enemies with swarms of bees, and when they tried to fight back with fire, the whole place caught a light. And has to barely got out alive. As the day began to draw to a close, droplets of water started to spatter across the panes of glass outside the carriage. And this soon turned into heavy rain, rain which assaulted the windows in a barrage as the unlike pulled forward. A dwarf, dressed up in an attire that looked far too nice for him, made rounds asking after everyone's comfort. The conductor first approached Hastor's door and tapped gently upon it. His three knocks were interrupted though and became two as he became aware of the muttering and buzzing sound from within. Quietly he opted to check back later and he moved down the way until he reached Iliana. Her demeanor was more pleasant though she still quickly declined any of the train's extra services and she shuffled him along. He came to the hearth where Moran sat now munching on a cinnamon stick. He asked the elf if he needed anything, and again he was politely ushered away. In truth, Moran didn't need any further services, as he had already snatched his snacks from two carriages up. He was delighted by the flavour of these wafer-like desserts which he'd stolen, and as the conductor left, he pulled out a few coins that he'd also snatched, and he examined them to make sure that they were of the correct currency. Dwarven coin and Highlander coin were of the same hexagonal shape, but one of the key differences was that the dwarves of Jurifen had far more intricate designs, with runes along the edging and their ancient king on one side and the holy sign of their religious order on the other. These coins were indeed Jurifen currency. Satisfied by this, Morin let a smirk cross his features as he leaned back in his chair and put his boots up on the table. Suddenly, there was a bass-filled boom followed by an intense warping of gravity. Morin felt his body go flying. The cinnamon stick in his mouth snapped and shot off in another direction. The impact was harsh and caused a sense of whiplash in his neck. He was slammed against the shelving in the corner. Things started to normalise for a moment, but then there was another smaller jolt of movement followed by the sound of metal being gnarled and distorted. And then everything stopped. Moran became aware of the stillness and the sound of the rain pattering on the windows. It was somehow still intact. He rose to his feet, slightly pained, but regaining his senses quickly. The Ganassi was half crawling out of her cabin, and looking very disorientated, and further up he could see the Dragonborn tripping over himself as he was followed by a cloud of bees that also emerged from the cabin. "'What's going on?' he said. "'I have no idea,' Ileana responded, as she made her way into the hearth, followed by Hastor, who was still stumbling and lacking a good quantity of grace while doing so. Moran approached the exit and fiddled with the door handle. It was slightly damaged by the impact, but with a graceful nudge, he managed to slide the door out, a torrent of cold air meeting his face as he did so. It was dark, and rain distorted the landscape, but Moran was an elf. His eyes could peer through the shroud, and as he did, he saw small armed figures approaching. They shouted at each other in a foul tongue, and while Moran didn't speak the language, he recognised its twang. Goblins, he said, as bolts flicked past his head and were jammed somewhere behind him. The three individuals now needed to work together despite having never met, and all having their own reasons to distrust people. Hastor took the lead, rushing outside and sprawling his wings. He flew up and began shouting some incantations which ignited bright bolts of energy from his fingertips. The goblins were numerous, but they fell very easily to his magic. 
Moran threw daggers first, and then swapped to his sword, dispatching the weak creatures with ease. Ileana fumbled with her pack and pulled out a bow and an arrow, and she knocked it nervously. She trembled as she began to release shots, and thus missed. Hastor felt something wrap around his wings before he felt the harsh roof of the caboose carriage meet his face. He became aware of a sticky web that had impeded his flight. He muttered foreign curse words and freed himself as long spindly legs reached at him from behind. He turned to see multiple giant spiders with cruel-faced goblins on their backs. They crawled up and began to surround him, trying to bite at him, the goblins thrusting pointy sticks as they did so. Morin had killed five or six by now, and he glanced about, seeing more shady signs of movement up the mountain a little. He took a moment to try and perceive how many there were approaching. Something strange caught his eye. The figures seemed to be fighting each other. A goblin slipped past his guard and crawled up to where Ileana was, still in the doorway of the carriage, attempting to hit targets. Well, this target was a little too close, and she found that her arrow had no force behind it. The goblin's blade was just about to pierce into her when Hastor battered away a spear that would have pierced through his cloak and punctured his shoulder, and then quickly he moved his fingers into a curl. His other hand pulled some kind of stone from a satchel that was strapped to his chest. He uttered words, the stone disintegrated, and his words turned into a scream, and the scream was loud. It rang out violently, causing the ears of the goblins to explode, and causing the spiders to retreat in fear and confusion. Ileana collapsed for a moment as she heard the sound, but so did the goblin assailing her. His eyes began to bulge intensely, before finally they melted into jelly, and the creature buckled. She got to her feet and put her bow aside, seeing more approaching. Whatever that sound was, it hadn't dealt with all of them. She stumbled out of the carriage and into the grainy mud, calling on the teachings of her druidic school. She reached out to the clouds with her mind and uttered a powerful word, and she pointed to a group of goblins who were about to be on top of Moran, and suddenly with a crack, they were struck by a lightning bolt from the sky. This was the moment that routed what was left of them. They cried out, and though they spoke in their own language, it was clear that their words were that of retreat. Now that the combat was settled, the three had a moment to examine their surroundings. The caboose was all that remained of the Umlag. The rest of the train appeared to have toppled into darkness along with what was once a grand bridge. The weight of the carriage was slowly pulling it towards a steep edge. As Moran regained his senses, he glanced over to where he'd seen the shadows fighting each other and he noticed that out of the darkness something was approaching. Its golden eyes reflected the small portions of light that remained, and at first it appeared to be a very large cat. But as it got closer, they all saw two tendrils protruding from its back, each one tipped with barbs. It also had two more legs than it should have. That is incredibly disturbing, Moran remarked, as the large cat sat and stared at them, making a light chirp of greeting. So this was not the end of the first session, of course, but for the sake of breaking up the story, this is where I'll stop. Two more players were about to be introduced, and of the total of five that were playing, three of them were incredibly new to the game, like it was their first game. It definitely showed during the initial introduction where none of them really wanted to interact on a train. Of the five players, only three of them would remain in the game until the very end of the story arc. And there would be a couple other players that would join in and maybe slip out, and then one player that would stick around. It got a little messy. But even with all that chaos, we still managed to pull a really fun story out of it. And that's what this is for, I suppose. For you to hear our story. Thanks for listening. I hope you all enjoyed that and want to tune in for the next episode. Stay safe, everyone.